So it's a real honor to be here. What I've tried to do in this talk today is to kind of meld, uh, you know, kind of a genetic lens uh, to looking at conservation. So that's why my talk is called Genetics and Conservation. So basically what I'll do is I'll kind of introduce, I mean, I don't, you don't need an introduction to conservation, but I'll just kind of uh, set, up, set the stage uh, in terms of both conservation and genetics, in terms of history. Uh, and then I'll kind of bring in examples of uh, our research, not to say this is the only research, but just because it's easier for me to explain, uh, which relates to species and populations uh, from a genetic perspective. And then I'll end up, because I said in the abstract, something about uh, are there conservation efforts which may not have succeeded without genetics. I'll just sum up with a couple of examples where maybe uh, species may not have survived in the absence of genetic information. Uh, and maybe this gives us a hint of where this field is really going. So we all know that we're losing species dramatically. This is a figure from a really nice and recent paper by Derzo and others, which shows that you know, species, despite conservation effort, right, despite a huge feeling for action, call for action, we've been investing money in conservation effort for a while now. Um, it's not like we've been directly hunting, poaching uh, as a mandate, right? Uh, overall, policy-wise, we've shifted to trying to conserve, trying to preserve, uh, but still uh, species are declining globally. And as you can see, this map uh, basically shows uh, the darker colors, uh, in a sense, show larger proportions of decline. You can see that in the tropics, this decline is particularly high. Um, and if you think about it, there's several other threats also which face species apart from just direct uh, hunting or poaching. Uh, so for example, this is an old map, but it shows uh, the human footprint uh, on our land, on our earth. And basically, you can very quickly see that India is amongst the highest in terms of human footprint or land use change. Thinking about this in another way, uh, Crooks and others uh, talked about fragmentation. This is in the context of carnivores. So this map shows where we expect habitats to fragment the most globally. And you can see, again, that uh, South Asia and Asia in general seem to be areas where fragmentation is particularly high, right? So clearly, there's many threats that face species. And this, none of these are probably, you know, I'm sure you know all about all of these. But just to kind of position ourselves, species are going extinct. And sometimes, oftentimes, even before we discover them. So if you actually look at um, you know, IUCN listings, uplistings, and downlistings, uh, sometimes the numbers don't really change because we're also continuously discovering new species, right? Uh, at the same time, habitats are being lost. We're losing forest cover and other natural habitats uh, and fragmenting populations. There's uh, very good evidence from past fossil records which suggest that populations prior to extinction show signatures of fragmentation. So it's not just something which we can show theoretically that fragmented small populations are more likely to go extinct, but we, can, we also have some kind of uh, proof of this from the fossil record, for example, with cave bears. Um, and of course, there's several other threats which I haven't even mentioned, like introduced species, competition from these species, new diseases, old diseases, and of course, the big one, climate change, which we sometimes don't even know how it's going to impact species. So now let's, uh, let's kind of switch gears and think about a different field. Let's think about DNA and genetics. So it's actually pretty interesting to think of the history of you know, DNA and sequencing. But I'm going to throw Darwin in there, because both Mendel and Darwin were really seminal thinkers in uh, our understanding of uh, evolution uh, as well as genetics. So it's interesting they were both alive around the same time. So Darwin published Origin of Species in 1859. And Mendel actually just gave a talk about his work on uh, crossing pea plants. Basically, he discovered. Uh, you know, Mendelian inheritance, the laws of inheritance uh, in 1865. So around the same time, they actually didn't know about each other's existence, and they certainly didn't know that DNA was the hereditary material. This was only known much later. Uh, very interestingly, flamboyantly, and now controversy, lots of controversy surrounds this, but in 1953, Watson and Crick described the structure of DNA. Okay? So they uh, kind of elucidated what makes up DNA. So before this, people already knew that DNA was the hereditary material. Um, and after this, 
much, much later, uh, Sanger devised a way, an experimental way, to read DNA, to sequence DNA. And uh, the amazing thing is, you know, this paper on the structure of DNA is cited 11,000 times. But this paper, which talks about how you sequence DNA, is cited 65,000 times. So that shows you that while uh, it's nice to know what the structure of DNA is, unless you can read it, unless you have a technology to actually understand what it's saying, it doesn't really do much good. And also very interestingly, Sanger, who was at Cambridge, he came up with the idea 20 years before he published this paper, but it took him 20 years to kind of figure out how to actually make a machine which could do this. And then there was no stopping the field of genetics. Uh, the next key innovation uh, was by Carrie Mullen, who showed in 18, uh, 1983 that you can basically uh, copy DNA. So, okay, so basically, so after Darwin and Mendel, 100 years, nothing happens, right? Almost nothing happens. And now suddenly there's a lot happening. So this was very useful because if you think about the human genome, which is three megabases, uh, the weight is 40 picograms. So it's really, really, I mean, it's very small, right? So how do you actually read the DNA when there's so little of it? So what people would do earlier is take lots of cells, lots and lots of cells, so you can get enough DNA to read. But with PCR, what you can do is, if you had a template or some kind of a, a base, you could copy that and make many, 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 many copies. And basically, you can turn a droplet of DNA into a swimming pool of DNA. So this is a fantastic technique. And this then allowed us to work with small amounts of DNA and gave us the ability to read it. The most uh, kind of amazing technological innovation of our time has been next generation sequencing. So in 2005, uh, using little beads and so on, there was a new technology proposed called uh, massively parallel sequencing, where you got a lot more data for much less. So just to give you an example, this is a graph from NIH. Uh, the first human genome was sequenced uh, you know, in the late, early 90s. I think I can't see that. Um, but basically, it took 10 years and $100 million. Okay? So it took a really long time. There was a human genome project, lots of labs all over the world, right? uh, mostly in the US. And now, today, it takes a week and $1,000. So basically, this is Moore's law which, for example, a lot, of, a lot of electronic technology or chip technology uh, changes in terms of its speed by Moore's law. And sequencing has simply broken Moore's law. So costs of sequencing today are cheaper than they have ever been before. And they're getting cheaper. Okay? There's now competing next generation sequencing technologies. There's also a third generation sequencing technology. So lots is happening uh, in the field of technology and genetics and DNA. So it's almost it's interesting to think how can this technology, or can it, be brought to bear on thinking about conservation? Can we leverage this technological power we have today to think about saving species? So what I'm going to do in this talk today is actually to talk at three uh, kind of levels of genetic organization. I'm going to talk about biodiversity hotspots and conservation. So this relates to basically finding out who are the new species, where are these species, how are these species distributed, and can their distributions actually help us think about their conservation? Uh, I'm going to talk about conserving species in the wild uh, and assessing populations and their connectivity. And finally, a little bit about managing isolated populations, a situation where you're close to extinction, you have to manage. You cannot simply, if you, don't, if you want to prevent extinction, you can't simply uh, you know, just study populations anymore. So these basically contrast to variation of the species, populations, and individual level. OK, so I love this map. Uh, and I'm sure many of you have seen it. But this is a map of how species are distributed across the world. These are all vertebrates. And of course, you can immediately see that it's not a uniform distribution, right? Some places have many more species than others, often the tropics, but not only the tropics. So these areas have traditionally been called biodiversity hotspots. And when you're thinking about conservation, we think of how do we conserve a patch of land or a patch of habitat which would give us the most benefit in terms of saving the largest number of species. So let's look a little closer to home. This is a species richness plot for uh, um, Asia. And uh, actually, uh, all of our work will have 
a picture here, which is the person responsible for that work. And many of the people who are responsible for the, all the work here are in the audience uh, and volunteers. So, so anyway, so basically, this just shows uh, kind of a, a snapshot of that, basically the same map, but plotted again. And it shows you basically, for example, what jumps out at you immediately is that Southeast Asia is burning up with biodiversity, but it doesn't seem like the Indian subcontinent is really that biodiverse, right? I mean, this is really red. This is not so, it's kind of not that high in diversity. So do we really have much less diversity uh, in, in uh, uh, India, in the Indian subcontinent, than in kind of latitudinally similar Southeast Asia. So well, we've kind of done a bit of work on discovering cryptic diversity. Uh, oftentimes, we don't start with this objective. We are trying to go and look at a particular question in the wild. And then it turns out, though, that several of the species which were right under our nose, we've seen them all the time, are actually very different. And so are different species. So just a few examples of this work. A long time ago, we collaborated with Aprajita Datta and found uh, uh, um, the leaf deer uh, in Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, it was known earlier from uh, Myanmar, but not from Arunachal Pradesh. Also, the black manjak, which was known only from China. Uh, Debo Priyo worked with Rana and I on the Munzala and showed that it's uh, uh, quite a different, genetically quite different from its closest relative. This is also from Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, Nishma is still working in the lab on pikas. And quite amazingly, the most common pika you see in Sikkim, uh, it turns out, is actually not what we thought it was. So these are often misclassifications. They are new in the sense that they are different from genetically different enough and morphologically different enough from known species. And they are often not you know, what you thought they were either in terms of they're not closest, uh, their closest relatives are also not what you thought they might be. Um, Ishan has been in the lab for the last year, and he's been working on uh, these lizards called lacetids. And there's a lot of cryptic diversity. Actually, this you could kind of understand it's in the Himalayas and the Northeast, but this is actually in uh, the arid areas of central India. Uh, and of course, uh, Robin, who's very well known to you, and Vishnu and others have uh, discovered two, uh, well, like I said, these have always been there, but they have. Uh, I don't know, I don't, discover is not the right word probably, but they've described uh, two new endemic genera of birds in the Western Ghats. So the laughing thrush and the short wing were thought to be laughing thrushes and short wings, but they're not. They're completely different from either of those. And finally, um, uh, Balaji and others have identified uh, a cryptic acoustic lineage of bats uh, in southern India. This is just some examples of uh, just in the last 10 years, just for mammals and birds, the number of kind of new lineages and species we're identifying. Though, for example, globally, we think we've described 97% of mammals. Okay? So the species discovery rate for mammals is much lower than, say, for insects. Right? So in spite of that, it seems like definitely the Indian subcontinent has a lot more species uh, than we would have thought, possibly because it hasn't been studied as much. So now, the next question then is, okay, even if we know what species are, how many species are there in India, which areas do we actually protect? So we have a protected area network, of course. Um, but this actually shows two measures of trying to quantify what you would want to save. Okay? So on, the, on this panel, you have what's called phylogenetic diversity. You can think of this as evolutionary distinctiveness or evolutionary potential, in a sense. Uh, how, how much evolutionary history is retained in, say, in this case, one of these cells. Okay? And I'm showing, here you, I'm showing you here maps for rodents and carnivores. Rodents are really important because half of mammals are, are rodents. So there are many in terms of the number of species. And this cartoon just shows you, for example, the, the phylogenetic diversity between these two, uh, say, uh, individuals, A and B, would be much lower than, for example, if you're considering uh, B and C, so from a different clade, for example. So you could imagine that a place uh, has lots of species, but not a lot of evolutionary potential. Or it has a lot of evolutionary potential, but not lots of species. And so there could be some cases where there's a discord between an evolutionary and an ecological uh, picture of a location. So then you might want to ask, um, should you then save what's deeper in terms of evolutionary time, or just 
more number of species. So for example, just to illustrate this, uh, I show you uh, <coughs> um, data from three protected areas. Say, if you were to compare Kaziranga, Kanha, and Periyar, and this is just um, for rodents. So you can see, for example, the phylogenetic diversity is way higher in Kaziranga compared to uh, any of these other two locations. But for example, there's the same number of species in Kaziranga and Periyar. Uh, on the other hand, if you were to take another perspective and talk about endemics, right, restricted range species, you find that the phylogenetic diversity of restricted range species is highest in Periyar. So now, without information of this kind, where we actually know uh, about evolutionary potential as well as uh, species richness, it's very difficult for us to think of conservation strategies, I think, uh, and more knowledge is definitely more power. Uh, unfortunately, we have very little knowledge of this uh, detail uh, in the Indian subcontinent. So now I'm going to switch to talking about populations and quickly run through some of our old tiger work, uh, which I'm sure all of you have seen. We use genetic data from tigers uh, across uh, uh, their range, basically, to show that uh, tigers had evolved potentially in South China and moved secondarily into India. This upset a lot of people because uh, for example, I talked once to a journalist about these results, and they said, what? The national animal is from China? This was not very <laughs> good. <laughs> but uh, you know, we are all from Africa, so it's just a matter of time how far back you want to look. Um, but how did we actually do this? It sounds nice to say, oh, you know, tigers evolved in South China and moved into India secondarily. Well, like I said, when you look at uh, DNA and you actually construct a model where you say, OK, I'm going to take Indian tigers as one population and other tigers outside of India as another. Uh, and I'm going to reconstruct movement, uh, in a sense, from here to there and there to here. What directionality of movement is higher? So it seems like, in this case, there's much more movement from outside into inside India and much less, a much lower parameter estimate for movement the other way. This indicates, then, that India was colonized uh, secondarily by tigers. Okay? Uh, we were also able to reconstruct a population decline. So this is an interesting picture, also interesting in the context of, uh, what's that woman's name? Ah, Taylor Swift and this recent song, which is causing a lot of controversy. This kind of reminds me of that, you know. Uh, but uh, yeah, so basically this is just a picture of the British hunting. Uh, and uh, it's really interesting. I mean, it's almost like we did some, uh, you know, whatever. We made this up. But we actually reconstruct, for example, the 200 years ago, these are little figures supposed to be tigers. India was chock-a-block with tigers. And Kriti has also shown this uh, in her paper uh, a few years back. Um, and then somehow, about 200 years ago, we seem to have lost 90% of our tigers. So you can see I've kind of shaded out those tigers which we lost. And you can, of course, guess uh, that you know these what was a large connected block right, is now fragmented into these little bits. So if that is true, then we would expect to see over time a signature of fragmentation as well, not just population decline, which results in a decrease in, say, genetic variation, but also kind of differentiation of fragmentation. So how, but uh, before I go on to that, which we're going to, uh, I'm going to tell you about those results, what was also very encouraging was, uh, as shown in this cartoon, uh, in spite of that decline, in spite of the 200-year-old decline, where we lost 90% of the tigers, if you look at genetic variation today, uh, and the whole tiger gene pool, if you, if you will consider that, uh, it seems like the Indian subcontinent retains 60 to 70% of global variation. So this suggests to us that uh, it's an important place for us to consider conservation of tigers, right? Because most of their evolutionary potential, like we talked about the phylogenetic diversity of Kanha or uh, whatever, most of the tiger species' evolutionary potential appears to be in the Indian subcontinent. So I said something about fragmentation earlier. So how do we again use genetics as a tool to detect fragmentation? This is again a simple cartoon, but imagine you had two populations, one in which these blue genes were more prevalent and another in which the red genes were more prevalent. So imagine one individual from here moved here, so you could actually pick it up uh, as potentially a migrant. And these kind of approaches are called traditionally assignment tests. Okay? So uh, this is what people use in forensics, in CSI, for example. How do they identify 
that a particular individual you know, is, is a criminal or whatever, right? So um, we are interested in trying to study tiger migration and how it's changed over time as reflected by uh, gene flow, right? So we're not really looking at dispersal. Uh, we're looking at kind of realized movement which has resulted in mating such that genes have been transmitted to the next population. So basically DNA records movements of individuals, uh, particular genes which are common in one place uh, and not in another, and we can detect these migrants uh, because of the genes that they possess. So uh, in terms of the history of tiger movement, uh, we, uh, we are trying to infer these landscapes or in a sense genetic landscapes of tigers. What are the breeding units of tigers uh, from a geographical perspective across the Indian subcontinent? So we're going to infer this based on what we think about movement or gene flow. Uh, and of course, if there's lots of movement, we assume that's one population. Uh, and if there's very little movement, we assume that those populations are fragmented or differentiated. So what do we actually see? So we were able to go back in time uh, using DNA extracted from up to 200-year-old skins. And we were able to show that 200 or so years ago, there seemed to have been large swatches of space that corresponded to continuous tiger populations. On the other hand, today, we see that, well, there are still some large uh, populations, but there seems to be fragmentation happening, especially in the context of Western India. And I'll come back to this single isolated population later in the talk. Right? Uh, so definitely, we do see a signature of disconnected populations over time. But it seems like this whole block is one population. So is this really true? So how did we actually infer this? Like I said, a lot of this also depends on the statistics we do. Uh, and like I said, we extracted DNA from skins and fecal samples. And we used markers called microsatellites. You don't need to know what they are. But we used between 8 and 12 bits of information okay, to do this. So maybe this is not enough information. So I told you in the beginning about genomics. So since, uh, since the tiger genome was sequenced about three years ago, we said, OK, let's take the plunge. Uh, and we tried to actually gather more information from the genome and ask this question again. Is Peninsular India a continuous population? So this new work, which has not been published, and all the way in the corner there is Meghna sitting on a rock. You can't see her very well. But we actually managed to get, uh, for this, uh, we need lots of DNA. We want to sequence the whole genome. So we have to start out by working with blood and tissue. And we were able to get uh, not the best sampling spread, but as far as possible, we tried to represent as many locations as we could, and about 50 samples from across the Indian subcontinent. All of this is from collaborators from the Wildlife Institute of India, CCMB, Aranyak, uh, and Wynard Veterinary College. We, are, we have almost no tissue samples of our own. We uh, did some, sorry, that is not very good resolution. We did some. Uh, uh, jadu, where we cut up the DNA into little bits. And we basically label each individual with a code. And we sequence all these little bits from different individuals. And we put them together to look at variation across the genome. Uh, and what we found was surprising uh, and really exciting. So basically, like I told you earlier, uh, I'll just show you this and then uh, explain it. So basically, what we had found earlier was that based on these microsatellites or 12 bits of information, that all of Peninsular India is one contiguous block. Uh, in, when we look at a lot more information, I'll tell you just how much, we find that basically the Northeast still seems kind of a little mixed up. But southern India, or the Western Ghats, separates from central India. So basically, this red, uh, all the individuals in red uh, are from South India. And genetically, they are cohesive. They have similar ancestry as compared to these bluish turquoise individuals who are from central India. Uh, of course, the western tigers separate out very quickly. Uh, and this is basically Tarai, which is uh, or, uh, purple. And uh, this blue is the northeast, which are kind of mixed. The other thing which is really interesting to see is if you look at, again, genetic variation as evolutionary potential, central India has way more variation than uh, any of these other populations. And that's kind of interesting. Sorry, sorry. Because you know it's in the middle. So central India is kind of linked to all of these different populations. And what we're doing right now is actually trying to work out, as we had done earlier, 
where we just did Indian tigers versus tigers outside, those gene flow maps for central India versus south India versus semi-arid and so on. So is it really true that there's more inflow or higher number uh, of tigers uh, from a genetic perspective in the central Indian landscape uh, or not? And uh, just to kind of put it in perspective, we used 12 bits of information before, and now we're using 12,000 SNPs, so like lots more information. So the reason that we actually got this pattern now is because uh, the division or kind of the difference between Central India and Southern India is small. So we still see that in our analyses uh, where we look at summary statistics and so on. But it's just that we have so much more power that now allows us to pick up even smaller differences, which we couldn't pick up earlier with a more like a uh, brute force method. The challenge, of course, now is going to be implementing these SNPs or these types of approaches to SCAT. So that's something which we need to think of, uh, again, from a technological perspective. And hopefully, if we get some funding, we'll work on that soon. So yeah, so now, again, back to some older work. So are tigers really moving? I mean, if this is one big landscape, one genetic landscape, are tigers moving? So this is, again, uh, slightly older work by master's student at the time, Aditya Joshi and collaborators. And basically, we took uh, kind of a set of protected areas in the central Indian landscape and using these assignment tests, reconstructed these movements. And this is amazingly far, uh, about 600 kilometers. Uh, so it seemed like a very, I mean, this paper really scared me. These results really scared me because I was like, can this be true? Can it be true, for example, that you know all sanctuaries are not equal, that uh, Kanha is like this bus stop with huge amounts of activity, lots of gene flow in and out, that Taroba, in spite of being a very well-protected, uh, high-density reserve, isn't really participating uh, in this whole game at all. Uh, and it seems like uh, there is potentially very long distance movement as well as possible. So we kind of redid this whole analysis uh, because I, I just wanted to be very sure. I mean, uh, just, to, just to also uh, remind you that there have been other studies in central India. All tiger connectivity studies have been based there. And other authors, like uh, a student of Jhala's, Yumna Matal, recently, and before that, Sandeep Sharma, uh, with different sets of PAs, have shown that there is connectivity. They haven't really, uh, I mean, there's not been much of a comparison of the details of that. But generally, it's not like this is completely wrong. So anyway, uh, Prachi, uh, and uh, in collaboration with Adi and several others, resampled this whole landscape. We have uh, a lot more samples now. And basically, we wanted to also ask, uh, A, what is connectivity in Central India, just to kind of convince ourselves that we were not wrong. And B, given uh, landscapes between protected areas, can we infer resistance to movement? So basically, we're trying to infer movement. So is movement simply a function of distance, how far one reserve is from another? Or does it matter what's in between these reserves? Does it matter if it's a town or a forest or an agricultural plantation? And we can use a model, uh, an electrical circuit theory model called circuitscape to infer resistance to movement. Uh, and then we basically try to, so we use genetics the genetics tells us the truth, OK? So now we know the truth. We know what is movement. We look at landscapes between populations to infer resistance, OK? Once we infer resistance, we then wanted to actually ask, is this all any, of any significance? So for example, do we have populations which will go extinct, potentially, because they are not connected? So what we do then is we actually model the future. So we understand the present, infer what is causing this movement pattern, and then try to model the future. So given resistance and predicted land use change, and I'm going to show you results only from uh, a model where we assume that as landscape changed in the last 10 years, so it shall continue to change for the next 100 years. So no change in policy or whatever. And I should also say that actually uh, the last 10 years has been pretty good. So it's not a very bad extreme scenario. Given current uh, policy scenarios, it seems like things may change more, given uh, whatever the development uh, uh, proposals for development, especially in this landscape in central India. And then we ask, what happens to connectivity? Do tiger populations persist? 
or do any populations actually go extinct? This is also unpublished work, and I, I'm really excited about this study, and I hope you'll find it interesting. So basically, the first thing is the basics. What is current connectivity? So again, these plots, you know, we call them structure plots. They're basically unbiased genetic groups of individuals which show up from your data. You ask your data, what are the groups? And basically, in the Central Indian landscape, which I've cut out, uh, you can't see them very well, but the PAs are marked in red. And you have Bandhavgarh over here, just to orient you, Kanha, Melghat, Paint, et cetera, et cetera, uh, Taroba over here. We didn't include uh, um, NSTR in this analysis uh, because we don't have high enough sample size from there yet. So basically, what we find is there's an orange cluster. You can see that without even looking at the map. This is only genetic information, only genes, right? There's an orange cluster, there's a yellow cluster, and there's a, I don't know what that color is, blue cluster. So basically, the orange cluster is this central cluster of protected areas. The yellow cluster is Taroba and its satellite PAs. And this blue cluster is Bandhavgarh. Okay? So basically, it seems like within this uh, landscape, there's three kind of uh, populations. So what happens to these in the future? Oh, sorry, before that, what is the resistance that we infer from this? So this, uh, so basically, this is just to show you that uh, we, we've done a mantle uh, correlation, and it turns out that night lights and tree cover, so tree cover is you know, basically forest area, and night lights is human habitation. It's a proxy for human habitation. Together, actually do very well at predicting genetic connectivity. So now, I can basically assign resistance to particular landscapes, but maybe I'm still not able to predict my genetic connectivity well. But it turns out that now we can do it much better than we did it earlier in the earlier study. And if you look at this, it's a conductance map. In a sense, if you were a tiger flowing around in this landscape, uh, you would most likely flow on these red channels almost. That's how genes are moving in this landscape. Uh, sorry, that's not how genes are moving. That's how the resistance of this landscape is. And so you would infer that genes would move in a similar way. So just look at that. Look at Kanha. It's like, <laughs> it's so connected to everywhere else. And look at Taroba. It's just, it's isolated, for example. So, uh, so yeah, so I think it's a nice, powerful image. But what's even more powerful is, uh, I tried to animate it, but I think it looks better just like this. If you actually predict land use change in the next um, 100 or so years, you find this landscape is growing from green to red to much more red, where red is urban. So basically, this is what the landscape will look like in 2050, assuming that the same rate of change is happening as has happened in the last 10 years. Okay? So now, given this rate of landscape change, how is tiger connectivity going to change? So are tigers going to go extinct? I mean, I, I don't know. Sometimes we, I wake up in the morning and think, oh, maybe they'll go extinct in the next 100 years. But uh, maybe not. So this is a picture of what we see of extinction probability. So basically what we've done here is we've modeled tigers with genes on this landscape, given a resistance surface over time with the landscape changing. And we've counted, we've done this a 1,000 times, and we've counted instances where particular populations are going extinct. Okay? So, and then this is basically just to show you, if they're red, they are always going extinct. And if they are blue, they go extinct sometimes. So amazingly, the central connected cluster, Kanha, Pench, Melghat, et cetera, et cetera, never goes extinct. None of the PAs go extinct there. Whereas these, I mean, it's quite amazing, of course. Uh, so yeah, so basically let me just, if I explain this a bit better, these small disconnected populations, which we think are potentially, you know, it's good, right? Tigers are moving outside to these areas called Tipeshwar, et cetera, et cetera. But they're too small, or the populations are too small. And so basically, they continuously go extinct. Uh, large and isolated populations, in our case, Taroba and Bandhavgarh, also do go extinct, but not that often. This is about 30% of the time, right? And of course, the best of are the large connected populations, which don't go extinct at all. So in a sense, uh, we could have predicted this, uh, you know, if you just think from a very simplistic uh, perspective. Uh, populations which are small 
and disconnected would definitely go extinct, right? But it's really nice to see this uh, in the context of simulations in a real landscape where there's real, uh, you know, space between protected areas. We've done several demographic versions of this simulation. So, for example, we allowed tiger numbers to grow as well, given kind of known growth rates. And even in that case, if you're just throwing tigers out outside the PAs, kind of into the landscape, generally there seems to be high extinction probability. Sometimes in these scenarios, the big isolated PAs are kind of rescued. So basically, uh, I won't show you all of our results, but what we do find though is if these tigers which are leaving uh, these large protected areas are clustered together, basically creating a new PA, then that is the only situation where you have a lowering of extinction probability across this landscape. So it's not just enough to maintain existing PAs uh, with unconstrained landscape change. Uh, it's not enough to just have tiger growth, as we seem to be having today. We see a lot of reports in the paper of tigers coming outside protected areas, lots of reports of conflict. But unless there are new protected areas created, uh, embedded in this landscape, we will not have a zero probability of extinction in the future. So I'll come back to some of the work Meghna did. I told you that this is, a, this is a PCA plot, another way to visualize the genetic data. And again, you see here that you know uh, Central India is different from South India is different from Central India and the Tarai and so on. But also very different from all of them is the semi-arid region or basically Western Indian tigers. Uh, and, and basically. We saw this earlier on from our uh, skin results, that these were the first to be fragmented or disconnected, right? And what's interesting as well is this now is a single isolated population, right? It's not even like, so for example, the simulations showed us that even populations like Taroba could go extinct, but here there's nothing else which is connected to Ranthambor at all. And if you look at the individuals in Ranthambor, on the y-axis here, I have relatedness. Individuals in Ranthambore have a high relatedness with each other, which potentially indicates that they are already uh, maybe inbred. So what we'd love to do, uh, if, if we get permits uh, in the future, a new student in my lab, Anubhav, hopes to actually look at genomes of Ranthambore tigers and quantify inbreeding, if it exists or not. So now I'm going to switch to talking about uh, individuals populations which have to be managed. And here I'm going to take an example from an extremely successful tiger reintroduction uh, by the Wildlife Institute of India, specifically Dr. Ramesh and his team. I love this picture. It's fantastic to see this animal walking out. looks so majestic. Uh, but basically, tigers went extinct in Panna. Uh, and we know, I mean, in the last 10 years, we've seen several local extinctions of populations, right? So the simulations that we do are not so uh, difficult to imagine. Um, but basically, there was a great political governmental will to reintroduce tigers into Panna. Uh, and uh, basically, this was done. Individuals were radio collared. There was a lot of monitoring which went on, stress levels, genetic variation, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and they have had a phenomenal recovery. So this basically shows uh, population numbers over time. And basically, they went extinct uh, around here. And then they've been reintroduced, and they're just like, increasing in numbers tremendously. So reintroduction can also be successful. There are many ways to do conservation. While it would be nice to just study things and not have to interfere, sometimes conservation will require intervention if we want to prevent species extinction. So this brings me to the end of my talk, where I'll just mention two examples where I think without uh, genetics, species may have gone extinct. So this is a really cute guy. It's the Tasmanian devil. Uh, which is the largest carnivorous marsupial. Uh, it's restricted to the island of Tasmania. And these guys basically have this really strange oral cancer, which in the 1990s devastated populations. So it's a really bad thing, because first of all, uh, you know, it uh, prevents animals from eating and they die. But it's also contagious. So it's a cancer that's contagious. And one animal spreads it to another by biting. Okay? So these are generally... Uh, very, uh, they, I mean, there's a lot of competition between males, so there's a lot of potential for biting. And so basically, because of this uh, cancer, the species was on the brink of extinction, okay? Uh, 
Uh, but it was good for this species that it, at this time, there was a possibility to sequence genomes. So in 2010, the genome of the Tasmanian devil was sequenced. The genome of cancer cells was sequenced. And scientists were able to find out what alleles or what you know, particular types of DNA can make an individual Tasmanian devil resistant to oral cancer. Fantastic. I mean, just like human genetics, where we're looking at what are the diseases res responsible for diabetes and so on, they've done it for the Tasmanian devil. And so now there's plans for, and they've already started, uh, reintroduction programs where they're trying to increase the allele frequency of the resistant allele in the population. So basically, there's a bunch of devils, and most of them have this cancer allele. But if you introduce these resistant devils, over time, the frequency of the resistant allele will go up. So this is a whole new field called assisted gene flow. People have been talking about assisted gene flow for, say, species which are not or are going to be hit by climate change. Again, there may be individuals who have genotypes which allow them to you know, be resistant to higher temperatures, for example. So there's talk about reintroducing such individuals into populations so that they can recover from detrimental uh, impacts of climate change. Uh, there's also, for example, such approaches applied in endangered species control. Uh, you could potentially introduce uh, individuals which could outcompete uh, introduced species and thereby kind of obliterate the uh, introduced species. So anyway, so this is an example where potentially the species may have gone extinct in the absence of genetic information. Uh, another really nice example is the California condor. So the California condor is this amazing bird. Uh, and basically in 1985, there were only 23 birds left in the wild. So now when you have a situation like this, you basically have to bring the animals into captivity. Uh, so there were 14 founders which were used to start a population. And there was a lot of captive management uh, and breeding. The breeding was planned such that inbreeding would be minimized. That is, you didn't allow all birds to mate with each other. You would kind of uh, plan the matings such that the offspring had the most amount of genetic variation or evolutionary potential. Right? So, so basically then, because of this, they were able to minimize the inbreeding. And today, uh, in, well, a couple of years ago in 2013, there are 424 birds uh, and 223 are in the wild. They've been reintroduced into four populations and they're doing really well. Not all reintroductions work well. So the example I gave you uh, of the tiger introduction is actually a, a rare one. Most reintroductions actually fail. But that's probably because there isn't enough follow-up on these reintroductions as to why they are failing, right? So anyway, this is a very successful reintroduction. And since then, uh, you know, these, uh, the genome of these guys has also been sequenced. And people have actually been trying to identify you know, what, what were the combinations of genes that the offspring got, and how did this breeding actually pan out. So in a sense, the breeding was planned based on theory. Right? It was planned based on, OK, this, person, this bird is related to this bird, and so on. But we can actually now look at what detrimental effects of inbreeding were avoided in the context uh, of, for example, the California condor. OK, so that's it. Uh, thanks very much. Before I finish, I should, of course, acknowledge all my funders and collaborators. Uh, and thanks very much for having me. <laughs> Happy to take questions. Hi, Uma. Hi. So, Hi, Farah. Hi. I think that was a fantastic talk. Thank you. Uh, I'm just, just going to carry on with your last example of California condor. Right. I think your lab has done fantastic work in conservation genetics, and I think there is so much for all of us to learn from that. But I think the biggest point I would like to highlight here is captive breeding and conservation genetics doesn't come into play if you don't really eliminate the problem, which is actually sure. there out there in the field. So just yeah. I want to add to everybody that if you just keep breeding them in the, in the captivity and releasing them in the wild, that's not going to work unless you eliminate. So just parallel to that is the example of vultures, which is the yes. diclofenic. Is, yeah. And we are also doing that captive breeding here. But right. if we don't eliminate diclofenic and release the back, yes. it's not going to work. So yeah, just yeah. want to have that. Yeah, very good point that Farah brought up. I mean, I guess uh, definitely genetics is always a supplement to conservation, right? It is, I'm not, uh, I don't think anyone would advocate it's the only thing. And like you're saying, no reintroduction, most reintroductions have failed. 
uh, mostly because they don't take out the cause for why the species went extinct in the first place, like the Arabian oryx. And there's a lot of problems with captivity and captive breeding. Uh, there's behavioral issues, so species get, uh, individuals get uh, adapted to captivity, and then they have to be trained to like recognize threats and so on and so forth. So it's definitely a last, uh, uh, you know, ditch effort. But yeah, unless you remove the threats in the wild, there's really no point to captivity.